Hey guys, Lucas Garvey here. This is the final part of my Dissecting Visual Aesthetic series. It's been very educational for me personally. I've had a lot of fun making it. I hope it was as helpful for you as it has been for me. In this final part, I just want to put everything together and discuss what it all really means. What really is the function of the visuals? Well, it's really simple. It's purely there to aid the story. It's there to increase dramatic tension when the story demands it, and it's there to decrease it when the story demands it. The visuals are a slave to the story. I'm sure most of you are familiar with story graphs. Some people call it the rising action graph. Some people call it this, some people call it that. It has a million names. Don't worry about it. It's all the same thing. Pretty much, it's just explaining that at the beginning of a story, it's calm. And then as the film continues, or any story for that matter, the dramatic tension rises and you have the rising action. And then you reach the climax. And then at, after that point, it kind of chills out and goes down. And this is a quite common trend in every story ever told. And it's true with the visuals, because the visuals need to coincide with the story being told. So on my computer monitor, I actually have a series of graphs that I created when I was working on my first feature film, The Irish Goodbye. I'm sorry I'm using an example of a film that you guys probably haven't seen before, but I really didn't want to go through the effort of taking another film and reverse engineering it and making graphs for it, so I'm just using my own graphs. So how does a story graph correlate to visual graphs? Well, what I did for my film is I pretty much broke everything up to every conceivable aspect of visuals, whether it was shape, whether it was squares to triangle ratio, circle to square ratio, everything like that, deep space, flat space, pretty much everything that we've been discussing the course of the series. And I created several graphs of, you know, how those should correlate through the entirety of the film. And there's some graphs that are completely flat the entire time because I just didn't really want to worry about it because if you have everything kind of going all over the place the entire time it gets a extremely complicated to keep everything straight it also just makes it very difficult for the audience to figure out what's going on whether on a conscious or subconscious level so i'm gonna read off some of the examples that i created and i'll just be flashing the graphs on the screen so the first graph is the story intensity the second graph is space and specifically flat versus deep and with all these graphs I have it where the top section of the graph is the more intense variant of the shot and the bottom half is the more relaxed. So on the bottom I have flat, which as we discussed is a very relaxed type of shot. And on the top I have deep, which is a very intense, insane kind of a shot. And as you can see, it kind of goes back and forth. And with a lot of these, they actually correlate directly with certain concepts of the film. So it's like, oh, if X happens, I want to cut to a deep shot. If Y happens, I want it to be flat. If you know Z happens, I want it to be limited. So you kind of just want to build up these sort of ideas in the viewer's head. So underneath that, I have another form of space, which is ambiguous versus recognizable. Underneath that, I have a form of line, which is curved linear versus linear. So over the course of the film, I wanted it to get more linear lines and less circles going on. So at the beginning, I wanted a lot of circles and curves. And by the end, I wanted the film to be very rigid with its composition. And a lot of that was because the main character is very wishy-washy. So I kind of wanted to sort of visualize that where at the beginning of the film, he's kind of wishy-washy. He kind of doesn't know what to do. He's all over the place. And by the end, he starts getting some structure in his life. Underneath that, I have vertical and horizontal versus diagonal. Underneath that, I have reflective control versus incident control. And this is for tone, which as we discussed, this is uh, lighting versus art direction. Underneath that, I have contrast versus affinity. And for this, I just had it maxed out at contrast the entire time. I didn't really want to change it up that much because I'm, I'm a contrasty kind of a guy. I'm wearing all black right now. It's just my kind of a thing. I like contrast a lot. So I wasn't really, I really didn't want to sacrifice that for the film. Underneath that is tone, and this is coincidence versus non-coincidence. And I think this is the only thing we didn't discuss. I kind of just didn't want to. And pretty much what this is, is coincidence means the subject is lit well. Non-coincidence 
means you really can't see them, right? So imagine watching a film noir movie and the subject is totally blacked down in shadow and the background super bright. So it kind of it obscures the subject. The graph underneath that is dark versus light and this is for tone. And for this, I want the first half of the film to take place at night and the second half of the film to take place during the day. And the reason for that is halfway through the film, an event takes place in which the main character finds something out that he really doesn't like. And it kind of just revealed itself to him. So I wanted to sort of illustrate that in an interesting way. So in the first half of the film, he's kind of in the shadows. He's kind of, kind of almost hiding from everything. He's kind of not accepting responsibility. Not even that he's not even accepting it, but he's ignorant to it, really. And then the second half, he sort of realizes all this shit he's neglecting and not taking care of. And that's sort of another way I used to visualize that. Underneath that is color versus black and white. And there's three scenes in the movie that are in black and white. Some of them are even just shots that are in black and white. Underneath that is hue, warm versus cool. So, you know, a low color temperature versus a high color temperature. Underneath that is saturation. So this is another interesting thing. It's pretty saturated the entire film until at the very end, it gets super desaturated for like one single shot. And that's just a kind of a technique I wanted to do to really highlight or unhighlight really that one very particular shot. And underneath that, you have movement, speed of the objects, so it starts off slow and then it gets faster and faster as the film goes on. The next graph is movement, left, right, up, down. Kind of peaks in the film, sometimes it's up and down. And up and down, I feel it's kind of more intense. It's more unnatural as opposed to left and right. So that was the most intense variant to me. Underneath that is induced and apparent movement versus actual movement. And then underneath that is rhythm. I wanted the film to start off with a very slow, methodical rhythm and then have it build up and get faster and faster and faster as the film goes on. And then underneath that is rhythm, sporadic versus consistent. So yeah, I just want to give you guys an example of this kind of thinking in terms to a real film and it being used in practice. I want to end today's video reading off a comment I got on a post I made on Reddit discussing the rhythm video I posted last week. Who cares a lot asked me the question, do you think the best works are created when the execution arises naturally through an artist's individual vision? Pretty interesting question. I then responded, that's a really tricky question. I've always felt that the greatest works come from an innate proclivity or feeling forcing the artist to act. When an artist tries to force an emotion or over elaborate on it, it has always seemed more like a piece of propaganda than a piece of art to me. However, I think it's almost required for an artist to think of their work in this craftsman way to over elaborate and scrutinize everything they do because it gives the artist time to meditate on the work and deliberate on it. It can almost be seen as busy work. A great example is The Godfather. During pre-production, Coppola painstakingly took every page out of the original book the film was to be based on and placed it inside a sheet of printer paper just for the benefit of having additional margins to take notes in the book. Coppola mentioned this in the foreword of the book, The Godfather Notebook. He added that this time-consuming task, which took about a week, did very little to improve the film directly. He could have easily just had a regular notebook to the side and take all of his notes in there. But he felt that this busy work gave him the opportunity to really meditate on the book and get a real sense of what the movie needed to be. So a lot of the time, I don't think the over planning or the hiding of hidden messages really helps the work directly. It certainly helps the artist making the work by giving them a menial task that allows them to figure out what the film is about, as opposed to these hidden messages being there to help the audience figure out what the film is about. I really enjoyed that question. I feel like it highlights the real meaning behind these series of videos. I want to thank Who Cares A Lot for submitting the question. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you did, give them all a like, baby. Click subscribe to watch more videos like this one every week. Thanks for watching. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.